Hey everyone, welcome back to the Going Scared podcast. This is your host, Jessica Honiger, founder of the social impact fashion brand Noonday Collection. Are you ready for honest and vulnerable conversations that will inspire you towards action? Join me here every week for conversations on living lives of purpose by leaving comfort and going scared. Well, we took a few weeks off this summer in order to bring you a new season of conversations. And we've been learning more about what you want to hear for this podcast through our listener survey. Thank you so much for those of you guys who hopped on over and took that survey. One of the things we learned is that you love the diversity of our guests and the topics we cover. Like me, you may have a lot of interests that don't fit easily into a box and going scared is creating a space just for that. It creates a space for us to embrace our multifaceted passions and hold the space to embrace paradox and all kinds of conversations from funny, vulnerable, inspiring, impactful. And today's guest is all of those things. Lauren Scruggs Kennedy is going to kick us off today, and she has inspired me for quite some time. I've always been encouraged deeply by people who overcome physical limitations and hardships. One of my best friends, Megan, adopted a little girl from Ethiopia several years ago, and her name is Tessa. And Tessa was born with no legs and only one arm. And when Megan first told me about Tessa, I'll be honest, I gulped and I wondered how Megan and her family were going to be able to do it. They lived in a two-story house at the time. They had no special van or extra money for any of those things. But Tessa changed all of our lives and she has taught me that people with limb differences are not defined by what they cannot do. And so it's because of Tessa that I wanted to have Lauren Scruggs Kennedy on the show. Because in December of 2011, Lauren was sucked into a plane propeller, which cut into her brain and the left side of her body. She lost her left eye and her left hand. In this episode, she talks about her recovery process, and we dive more into how she got her confidence back after a traumatic incident that left her physically altered. Lauren has gone on to become the co-founder of the Lauren Scruggs Kennedy Foundation, which exists to bring hope, restore confidence, and ignite faith in girls and women with limb loss by providing beautiful cosmetic coverings for prosthesis. She's married to Jason Kennedy, host of E! News, and now she spends her time running her blog, laurenscruggskennedy.com. To celebrate Going Scared returning for a new season, we are doing a fun collaboration with Lauren. She picked out her favorite pieces from the new Noonday Collection line and is giving one of our listeners a subscription to her Clean Living Guide. This guide will lead you on a journey toward clean living by diving deeply into food, products, and healthy practices. It is worth $130 in addition to all of the beautiful things she picked out from Noonday Collection. So head on over to my Instagram to get the details and to enter. Now for today's conversation. As I was thinking about what to talk with you about, I thought, where do I start? I mean, there's fashion, there's limb differences, there's entrepreneurship. You have dry shampoo. And girl, I have been using your (laughs) dry shampoo and I didn't know it was yours. Wait, are you serious? What in the world? No, I received it, I think, at If Gathering. And I love it because it's a great travel size, you know, to, to travel with. And I thought, this is so interesting. I really liked it. And then today, as I was prepping for the interview, I was like, oh my gosh, that's Lauren's dry shampoo. <laughs> Wait, that's so, so nuts. That's the best thing ever. It is. So cool. So why don't first give us sort of the 101, because you're so multifaceted. You're so so multi-passionate. I'd love for you to just kind of give, introduce yourself to our listeners today. Okay. Yeah. So um, I never know where to start, but I guess I'll just say, so I grew up in Dallas, Texas, um, super close to my family. I have a twin sister and we're like best friends and we had an interesting growing up, um, time. So I loved it so much, but there's, um, kind of a big story there because my parents were 
married for 10 years, divorced for seven, and then they got remarried to each other. Um, so we learned a ton growing up just about relationship and community. And um, I feel like my sister and I took on the parent trap role and literally we would watch the movie and like do all that stuff on my parents oh my and gosh. try to get them back together. <laughs> That I is know. amazing. Yes. So they were divorced when we were four to 11. So it was, yeah, during that whole phase. And um, did any of your tactics work, do you think? I don't know. Like we would do, oh my gosh. I remember one time we were like, okay, um, I call my mom Mo, but I was like, Mo, kiss me on this side of my cheek and my dad on the other side. And then we would like bend down so they would kiss. <laughs> we were like just the dumbest, <laughs> like the dumbest thing. But um, yeah, I remember, so my mom became a believer like literally right after they got divorced, which led to this whole reconciliation journey. Um, and she just, I would watch my mom just spend time with God and journal and she'd always be in this big comfy chair and have her coffee and her journal and her bible and so my sister and I just always wanted to copy my mom so I feel like we learned from her like how to spend time with God and that was in my journal like every day just I pray my parents get back together and so um that was just a crazy journey and like I still like can't believe that they're back together they've been back together now for about 20 years and Uh um yeah, just such a learning experience, but really good for both my sister and I relationally because we just had such, I don't know, a realistic point of view rather than, I think a lot of people, this is such a general statement, but I feel like the South can specifically be this way. I've learned this from just different cultures that I've lived, or when I lived in New York and then here in LA and then Dallas, but you can get so caught up in the like, plan of life like oh okay I'm graduating from college now I get married and my husband's gonna meet all my needs and my life's gonna be perfect and then I'm gonna have kids and I feel like it's so easy to get caught up in and um I walked through that with some friends of mine and so I'm thankful for our experience because it didn't put that perspective or yeah I don't it made me not have that perspective on marriage it was more I want a partner in life and um yeah, just a real Mm. relationship. And I want to be vulnerable. And I think I realized like the importance of communication and all those things. So that's that one portion. Um, And then I love that, though. I was just hanging out with a couple of 20, like six year olds last night, and they aren't married yet. And they were like, so what's your advice? And I said, just Mm. find look for a life partner. Like, you know, like love, love is fine. Romance is great. But like, find a partner, you know, and that's really how my marriage has played out. We're just, we're really good partners for life. And I mean, he even quit his job a couple of years ago. He's a full-time stay at home father now while I'm running the company. And it's like, I don't think uh, that would have happened if we just didn't have like a really clear understanding of partnership. So I love that that was kind of a key takeaway from walking through that with your, with your parents. Yeah, it's so true. And it kind of, even now, so um, I'm skipping around a little bit, but I'm like married now. And I feel like just it, I don't know that perspective, like Jason and I are best friends. I feel like we literally, he left for like less than 24 hours, two days ago. And we were both like, <laughs> we have like separation anxiety. Um, but I'm like, I'm so thankful for that because I feel like we've built our relationship so strong because we both have that same viewpoint and we're so vulnerable with each other. And we almost like value creating a safe place for one another, but encouraging each other literally in our struggles. So even a struggle that could affect me that he has, or a struggle that could affect him that I have, or just struggles that wouldn't necessarily affect either of us, but, um, or fall on either of us. But we just like encourage each other in our struggles. We're like, we're on the same team. Like we, it's just, yeah, it's just a perspective to have like, um, just grace and we're in a marriage, but just understanding more the purpose of marriage rather than it being like, Mm. you know, love and romance, which I feel like that comes even heavier when you have such a vulnerable relationship, you know, like if you focus on the friendship and the partnership, then you're just like so crazy about each other, you know? Yeah, totally. So fashion journalism. Okay. So I went to call or graduated college and then, um, during college, actually I started reporting for fashion weeks um, specifically in New York. And then I did one in Montreal, one, one in Paris. And 
I was just like so fully in that and did two internships in New York and loved every minute of it, learned so much um, about the fashion industry. And so, yeah, after I graduated from college, I was like, kind of took from all of my experiences and I um, interned at Gossip Girl Wardrobe, which was like super creative and every day was so different. And I would be going to showrooms a lot and dressing um, the actors and actresses in the show. And it was a really small team, so it was super fun because they just let me kind of join in a lot of, you know, projects and let me wear a lot of hats with them. And um, and then I worked um, at Michael Kors showroom. So that was another internship. So I learned about just like the business end of things, um, fashion week, but on a different end, like dressing models and preparing like the clothing for them. Um, and then alongside, this is all alongside reporting for fashion week. So after I graduated, I'm like, what do I love? And what do I want to do? Because there's so many aspects of that industry. So I kind of gathered together all the things I love the most. And out of what I learned um, in my like experiences over the last two years before graduation, I was like, I love writing. I love relationships. I love brands. I love sharing brands that I love. Um, I love numbers and math and all these things. So I was like, I think I'm going to start a blog. <laughs> which was like not really happening then. It was, um, I remember there were like five blogs that I knew of and that I could find, um, which is crazy to think about now because there's just- and What year was that? It was 2011. Okay, yeah. So that was sort of right when blogs were beginning to take off. Yeah, I know it's crazy because we had, I think like eight girls. They were all, we were all friends in Dallas, but we were all starting a blog. Even our friend Amber was starting Reward Style, which I feel like is just- changed so much of the marketing industry and blog industry um we were all doing it at the same time and we had no idea what we were doing because there's no history in the business and we would all just help each other and be like okay how do we turn this into a business and how do we do this well and so it's kind of crazy to think about now because we were all at that point where there was just yeah it was just the very beginning phases but um yeah so i started my blog which Um, at the time I kind of had the vision to turn it into a print magazine one day, but, um, about two months after I started my blog, it was really expanding quickly and growing a lot within the first couple of months. And then I had my accident, um, where I was hit by a plane propeller. So lost my left hand and left eye and had a traumatic brain injury and just was on full recovery for about two years. Um, So I just paused everything career oriented and just was healing physically and emotionally and spiritually. And, um, I feel like my life just flipped upside down, but not, I don't even mean that negatively, just new passions. I discovered, um, my story became basically like national the night of my accident and no one knows how that happened. And so, yeah, it was like a big shift in life within a day. (laughs) I mean, how did that, I mean, you you had just, you're at that like beginning of this exciting career. You're passionate, Mm -hmm. you love style, you love fashion. And then you have something very physical happen to you that changes your physicality. And yet you've been in this industry that's notoriously overly focused on perfection and physicality. Tell us about that journey of reconciling those two things. And then I want to talk if your style changed, like pre-accident, post-accident. So it was a really hard journey, to be honest. Um, And I feel like anyone that's gone through a trauma of any sort, um, I think one thing that happens or something I experienced is that kind of all your idols are right before your eyes because it's almost the things that bother you the most or you kind of see what you held so much value in. And for me, that was what I looked like physically. And um, it's interesting because I didn't realize that necessarily because I wasn't thinking 24 seven about how I looked. I was super like roll out of bed, brush my hair really fast, not put on much makeup, like throw on (laughs) just like some clothes that I like was in the mood to wear or whatever. And um, I realized just how much, yeah, I valued that. And Um, but if I thought about it before my accident, I wouldn't think I put much value in that. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. You feel like, or I felt like I was just more stuck, like, oh my gosh, I can't get my hand back and healing is slow. Like I, 
um, got a prosthetic eye really quickly just to get back to life where I wouldn't have to wear a patch all the time. And the first one you get, like your muscles around your eye are still healing. So it's swollen and um, my head was half shaved. So just waiting for my hair to grow out. And I think it was just such a learning journey and just having patience and knowing, oh my gosh, okay, where's my identity and where can I put my hope? And I had such, or I have such an amazing community and just so many people wrapped around our family and me during our healing. And there were just times where I was like, this still just is not enough and I need Jesus. And um, for me, that whole process really deepened my faith and made it so much more real for me because I had such like a need for Jesus. And um, I still look back at those times and I'm like, I'm so thankful for those like precious moments where I really like grew in my dependence for the Lord. Um, and yeah, so it was hard to reconcile um, even just like, yeah, my industry and then what I looked like and just that fear of, oh my gosh, what are people going to think of me now? And um, does their perspective of me change and really struggling with putting a lot of weight on what other people thought of me. And um, I kind of was proven wrong with that assumption or fear because I feel like just so many people um, related to my story. And it's one of those things where God's working so heavily, but I personally, as a human, wasn't doing much. <laughs> I was just like mm -hmm. living my life. And um, so it was really cool to see just, yeah, just how people were encouraged in their own pain. And um, I think the story in a way made me more relatable to people because I think a lot of times I, I'm just like speaking from what's kind of been created through social media and all that today, but you can look at someone like a blogger or an influencer or a celebrity or what, whoever it might be, and they're not relatable in any sort of way. And so I'm thankful for my story. Um, not that all these people knew who I was at that, at that moment or anything, but just, um, I think just anything vulnerable or anything relating to pain and just the ability to use your experience to yeah, I keep saying vulnerability, but just to be vulnerable and courageous mm -hmm. to tell what you've learned um, just impacts people a lot. So I'm, I'm thankful for that time. And and so when you're rec recovering for two years, which is a full-time job, I mean, I have had yes. friends with traumatic brain injuries and it is, oh, wow. there's so much hope, you know, because of what mm -hmm. the brain is capable of restoring to, but then it's also yes. such an unpredictable journey. And what were you thinking about your career at that point? Were you thinking, gosh, I still, I mean, you didn't change your loves and your passion. You loved fashion yes. and you loved writing. And so how did that mm -hmm. sort of evolve as you began to recover and kind of get back to, to work? Yeah. So um, I feel like during those two years, I didn't even have mental space to even think about my career, which was kind of good now that I think about it. Um, but one thing that kind of came up actually was stranded our dry shampoo and I moved in with my best friend probably I'm so bad with timelines but I want to say around like a year after my accident and this idea sparked up and so we started working on that project which was kind of my first like get back to my career kind of um job or project and then I ended up so I hired this girl it's just so crazy, but she lived in Dallas. I had never met her in person, but she was looking to start a blog and she started blogging on my blog, which had been basically like on pause for that period of time. And, um, I feel like she, she, it was so cool. Cause she like learned so much and, um, kind of learned the blogging industry. And I was kind of just kind of in the background, like she would ask me questions, but she was posting on my blog, which I feel like got it more out in the open and on the map again and kind of um gave it a refresh button kind of thing but um was she blogging on your your behalf or as like as her or were you dictating to her or what did that look like yeah she was blogging on her so on my site but on it was like it was almost like it was her blog but on just my url <laughs> if that makes sense okay yeah. um, but it was so perfect for the time and so nice but i feel like she's kind of the person that spurred me on into getting back to everything because 
just being in the background kind of got my mind working again on what blogging looked like. It got me thinking about, hey, what do I want to focus on? What's my brand? What are my passions? How can I talk about things um, that I've learned and incorporate that into fashion and things like that? And so she actually started her own blog after probably like two years of writing on mine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, here we go. I like need to continue this. And um, had an amazing friend of mine. She's like my assistant, which sounds weird. She's like one of my really good friends, but she just does so much for the blog. And then we really have redefined my brand in the last couple of years through my friend, Julie Solomon. She helped me kind of hone in on what my brand is and what my passions are. And um, yeah, all of that. So I know I'm kind of hopping around a lot, but that's how I got back to everything and um, had new passions. Like my passions really shifted. They were still the same and like innate with me still the same, but they just changed. And um, yeah, tell us a little a bit more about that. Like how your passions do shift. Cause you could have come out of that and been like a fashion, whatever. It's so shallow yeah. or, you know, yes. ugh, forget that. And I just <laughs> love how that you didn't do that, you know, and mm-hmm. you have an amazing sense of style. I love your style. Oh, and you. So what are some of those shifts that, that you saw that began to happen? Like when you say your brand evolved, you know, what, what does a traumatic mm-hmm. injury kind of look like? How does that show up for you? Yeah. So one thing, it's kind of funny. I feel like right after my accident, I, you know, you're just subscribed to all these brands and, you know, things that you get emails from. And I was just getting so many fashion emails and I told my mom one day, I was like, I swear if I see another email about a shirt, like I'm just going to freak out because I'm like, this is so not important. And I feel like you go from like such an extreme right after you experience something like that and then totally get back into life. But it was funny. So I transitioned out of that, but I was like, I just, I think I was just craving the um, desire to just be real and focus on things that were important, but also supporting being who you are. And I feel like fashion is a huge part of that and just how to express yourself and be creative and things like that. So that's kind of my blend of what I like to do on the blog, but a huge passion of mine was just the prosthetic world. And, um, I, so I received like a few prosthetic arms within six months of my accident because they encourage that because your arm will atrophy and it's important just to get right right to it. So um, my insurance covered the majority of my arms. Like, So I thought that was just such a common thing. And then I started meeting girls that would just come up to me in the grocery store um, or at an event I was at or something like that and just show me their arm and they're like, Lo, where did you get your arm? Like mine is falling apart. I have holes in my thumb, like just so many things. And I just realized over time. So even another friend of a friend, she was deciding whether or not to save for in vitro or another arm. And I just kept hearing story after story and realizing insurance rarely covers a really good quality prosthetic arm. And it just broke my heart. And I just remember exactly where I was in Dallas in my car. It's so weird. Um, And I just started praying about it. I was like, God, I want to be a part of like a shift in this. Or just, I want to help. And I know how much wholeness my prosthetic arms have brought me. And they even just got me back to life. Like even my workout prosthesis, like I can do really anything in the gym. And um, just to think of people, like girls, girls specifically, like going through such loss and then having to have, that burden on their shoulders of fighting insurance, which is just terrible for something that Mm, they need. Um, Yeah. And so we started the Lawrence Drugs Kennedy Foundation um, within that next few years, but it was a really cool process of just meeting another girl who had this, a similar passion that lost her leg when she was eight in a train accident. And then my friend Lisa, who's almost 60 and she lost her leg um, when she was 16 And they just started noticing um, that, yeah, they just had the same burden. And we, so my friend Bethany Hamilton, so she lost her arm when she was bit by a shark, um, I think a little over 10 years ago now, which is crazy. But she and I started this retreat for girls that have lost limbs. And 
that's when we really started noticing, oh my gosh, okay, so many girls. We were more like arm people, so it's grown into like girls that have lost legs that have come in. And But the first year, it was like majority girls that had lost arms, and they're about 15. And none of them had a prosthetic arm on. And I was so confused. I'm like, wait, where, where are everyone's arms? Like, do you want one? Do you not want one? Like, I was just so curious about it. And that's when we started realizing the struggle with insurance. And so, so a lot of people didn't have them because of insurance. Yes. That was like the whole, like everyone's answer to why they didn't have one was that. And so that's what kind of led to the birth of the foundation. But um, yeah, that was another huge passion of mine because it's so interesting because, okay, so like a prosthetic arm is a physical thing, but it just ignites a lot of confidence in someone that's experienced loss, a limb loss. And um, yeah, it just also reminds me of that scripture of just comfort as you are comforted. And um, it's just been cool to be able to do that through the foundation and then just see um, just such a shift in these girls' lives and also just have someone to walk through the prosthetic journey with because you don't ever expect to have to like pick an arm or a leg and you're like, how do I do this? And where do I go? No and kidding. Yeah. Take us on a little bit of a journey from, you know, someone that you've gotten to know and who's gotten to receive a limb thanks to your work. Oh my gosh. There's so many amazing stories. So it's hard to choose, but um, we, so our first girl, she is so amazing. Um, but she was about to get married and she had just experienced a limb loss. Like I want to say six months to a year before um, she was about to get married. So um, it was just like a crazy journey. And um, the, I don't know why this is so short and sweet, but she received her arm and she's just the most joyful, like full of life person. And just seeing her gratefulness, but also her desire to help other women because of what she experienced through like the gifting of an arm was just so cool. Wow. And, yeah. And then another girl, she's like, just, I love her so much, but she has battled cancer for years and has a little boy. And, um, so she received an arm, um, just like amazing. I don't know. These women are so courageous and incredible. And, um, another really good friend of mine, Carrie, she was actually one of the first girls at, um, the retreat that we did. So I think that started like six, six years ago, maybe. And she was like a little like shy and just um, not super confident, like with her, I don't know. I think she was just like still kind of finding her identity. And she, um, we gifted her an arm, I think like two weeks ago or a month ago. I'm so, again, like bad with time, but it was really recent. And she was born without her arm, but just to see over the years, like now she's a leader at the retreat and she's just so amazing. And she does physical therapy. That's her job. And um, I don't know, just to see how it helps these girls like have this new level of confidence, but also it helps her with her job mm -hmm. with physical therapy. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And just standing in the gap. I mean, I think mm -hmm. for those of us that haven't had to deal with insurance over complex issues, it's easy for me to think, well, of course, insurance would cover these things. I told you about my best friend. My best friend, her husband is a prostheticist. And, and then they have, they've adopted one child that is missing one limb, his <gasps> leg. And then oh they adopted another child that has no legs and one <gasps> arm. Oh what? And so I've just learned so much being friends with them. And we just, we took yes. them down to the ranch recently. My folks have a ranch. I'm, I'm Texas too here. Yeah. And <laughs> thankfully, I mean, just seeing, getting to see what that limb was able to do. I mean, for, you know, one of the kids with his leg, I mean, he was just running around with the rest of the kids, you know, he's super yes. athletic. And then for Tessa, the little girl, she has a wheelchair. And I mean, it was such a crazy story, like figuring out how to, you know, get insurance to take care of this wheelchair that enables her to like, even in the crazy grass and the gravel roads, and she's just like going for it, you know, and um, I just, I just love your work with people with limb differences, because it is such a distinct um 
disability or different ability. And I love that you've brought so much light to that. How has that affected your style? I'm curious, like when you think (laughs) about like how your style has evolved over the years, how would you describe your, your style? Okay. So it was funny. My sister told me a couple of years ago, she was like, your style has changed so much since you moved to LA. I was like, really? How has it changed? And she just said it's like more chill and just like really neutral and all this stuff. And so I feel like I've always kind of been that way, just like more, I don't know ever how to describe it, but just, I love like the beach and just the lake and water and sun and um, just like natural look. And so I think I've just evolved more into that. So just like chill, comfortable. Crazy summer, California. I love California style. Oh, it's the best. And even I get like overwhelmed if I have to wear a dress. I'm like, oh my gosh. (laughs) Like I'm getting more into them a little bit, but like a dressy dress. I'm just like, this is so not me. I can't wait to get out of it. (laughs) Like get back into like jeans or like whatever. Um, But yeah, so I'm like very minimal on accessories. I'm just like, I think minimal might be another good description, but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because sometimes I think about this, but I am a fashion blogger. I think I've, I have gone way more into focusing on wellness and all that, but like incorporating it into fashion. But um, I don't have a very natural gift of like putting an outfit together. Sometimes it's like, I'm even experiencing this. We're renovating our house right now. And I have the hardest time picturing something like I can't picture Uh, what, you know what I'm saying? Like a new floor is with this countertop and these, you know, so I'm like, I can tell you what I like in a picture, but I just like, can't always do that myself. So I feel similar with fashion. Like I just dress kind of how I'm feeling that day. And then also just on day to day errand things, I'm just wearing like yoga pants and (laughs) workout clothes. Um, oh, you should see what I'm wearing right now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I no love video it. No podcast interviews. As you're renovating yeah. your house, are there any mm-hmm. things that you're taking into mind in regards to not having an arm or are there any considerations there? Not really. It's so interesting. Some people ask me this, like, how is anything like hard for you to do or was hard to learn how to do? And it's just so crazy how fast your body adapts to one arm. Like I just, I really don't think about it very much because you just, it's almost like your body just has like an instinct to do something differently or to figure it out. And um, yeah, so I haven't really had to think about it with our house or anything. Um, But yeah, I think the hardest thing for me was learning how to round brush my hair again. And Mm -hmm. the craziest thing happened. It was so cool. We, Actually, we were talking about this lady the other day, but when I was dating Jason, I went to this birthday party when I was out here in LA and um, there was this lady that Jason worked with for like seven years and that whole seven years, he had no idea that she had a prosthetic arm. Like it just looked really realistic and in one day it was just really funny how they found out, but she asked for help to like butter her like a bagel they were eating and he was like butter your own bagel like kidding with her and she was like I literally can't and he was like oh my gosh I'm so sorry I had no idea (laughs) and so um all that to say so we ended up he was like I really want you to meet her and she happened to be at this party and I'm like I like meet her and I'm like oh my gosh you round brush your hair don't you because it just looked it I could tell and she was like yes and I'm like I cannot figure out how to do it it's driving me crazy and she was like I'm gonna send you a video and I think it'll help. And that video literally was like it for me. It just taught me how to do that. Wow. So, that's amazing. I, I hope I you know, share so that I, video on your blog. I haven't. I honestly need to find it. Like it was so long ago and I didn't even think twice. Like I just was like, yeah, I didn't even think to share it at the time, but I really need to look back and see if I can find it. But it's just so funny how little moments like that happen. Yeah. Look yes. at There's someone out there struggling. She d- she can't figure it out. So <laughs> Yes. I'm like, what are the odds? Like, that's so crazy. Yeah. So there's been like little things like that, but for the most part, it's like. Okay. So you mentioned your husband. You no longer live in Texas. Take us on that journey real quick because now you live in LA and you're, can I still call you newlywed? I don't know at what point you can say you're no longer newlywed. I feel like we still are. 
I know. We've been married for almost five years, but I feel like, I don't know. We just are closer than ever. And like, we just like love each other so much. <laughs> I'm sure y'all uh, experience the same thing, but um, yeah, it's so special. But so I don't know. I don't know. Would we be a newlywed at five years? I don't know. Let's, let's call it, let's call it a newlywed. Let's just say it. Yeah. Let's do it. I mean, if you're going to be married <laughs> for 50 years, you know, yeah, good you're point. new. Good point. True. <laughs> Heck, oh. I'm a newlywed with that being the definition. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I love it. Okay. So how'd you meet Jason? Okay. So when my accident happened, um, so he's a host on E! News and his co-host, Juliana Ranzik, she was actually going through breast cancer at the time. So she was getting a double mastectomy and she saw my story when she was healing in the hospital. Um, she saw it on TV and she just told her husband, Bill, I have to get a hold of her. I need to tell her like she has so much life ahead of her and just encourage her and all these things. So she reached out on Twitter one day and we just really started getting to know each other. She was like super real with me. We Skyped a few times, talked on the phone a little bit. And um, so probably after like about a year, she was like, do you want to come to LA? I'd love to meet you in person. And do an interview and I had done a few interviews with people just about my accident, like Today Show, Katie Couric, things like that. Um, and she was like the one person where I was just like so excited because I just felt like I had a relationship with her and um, I feel like all the other press stuff, stuff, it just like, I don't know, I never know like how to explain it, but it just was so um, sudden. And so we had to make so many decisions so quickly and I feel like this one was just so different because it was like, I knew I got to know her pretty well. And um, yeah, it just was like a really, just a gift to like um, Mm. hear just her own struggle with her journey. And it was really great to connect with her. So I go to LA with my mom and it was actually really funny because I was doing my rehab at this place called Athletes Performance. And it was, I was like the only girl, but I would be there every day for like two hours with my physical therapist who was also a trainer. So she was just like kicking my butt while helping me just heal wow. at the same time. Yeah. I loved it um, so much, but there were like 20 guys probably that were around my age, like minor major baseball and football players. Um, and they just became like my brothers and just good friends. And um, there was this one guy, I just had the biggest crush on him ever. And we would like hang out. I would like hang out with some of these guys just outside of, training and stuff but I was like apologizing to my mom before I'm like I am so sorry I'm so distracted I have like the biggest crush on this guy and um so it's just like funny how life happens but I came here to interview with Juliana and she was like do you know Jason Kennedy and I was like I think so like it sounds kind of familiar and she was like I want you to come to set and meet him I just feel like you guys would be great to know in the industry and like all this stuff so I was like, okay. And um, my mom and I went to set that afternoon and met him. And it was just just like a normal like meeting thing. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's your watch brand? My dad loves watches. And he was like, what are y'all doing? And like here in LA. And he wrote like a few spots for us to go to and then put his number at the bottom and was like, I'm going hiking with one of my really good friends tomorrow. If you guys want to join, just text me. Ooh, and Nice. Smooth. <laughs> smooth, right? Um. But I did not think anything of it. I'm so like, some of those things just go over my head. So um, he, yeah. So the next day I ended up texting him. There's like a lot of details to the story. So I'm just going to leave those out because it'll like go on forever. But I ended up texting him, which was very unlike me because I don't know how you were, but I'm, I was like very Southern in that way. And like, I just don't have guys contact me. (laughs) I like wasn't a big. I'm so over it. It's not how I'm raising my daughter, but I was definitely right? raised that way. I know, me too. So, anyways, I like texted him, but we ended up going for a hike, and it was like just the best. I feel like he was just so real. Um, I feel like yeah, there's just nothing. You know, when you meet someone, you're just like, wow, they are who they are, and there's just like that mm. is who they are. You just don't. So refreshing. Yeah, it was so refreshing. Um, he just thought about so many things prior to like we, my mom and I are driving and we think we're like going to the Canyon and we're going to his house and we're like, Oh my gosh, I hope he's like 
not like a creepy guy or something. Like we're just like, we're going to his house. We like don't know him at all. And, um, but he had us come there just cause you lose service on the Canyon. So like we wouldn't have been able to meet and he like has all the water bottles and like all this stuff. But, um, yeah, so as we got to talk a lot on the hike and just like so fun. And then later I found out he had actually been watching my story like since the night of my accident. And really? He, yeah. And he was just so intrigued by it. And he, I know this about him now, but like when he gets hooked on a story, he will like research it for hours and just like follow every ounce of it. And so that's kind of what he did with my story. And he watched, I did this segment on um, Dateline, I think. Yeah. Um, with Natalie Morales and he was watching it in his room and he was like, he like told one of his, ro- his roommates, he was like, I want to marry a girl like that. Like I no just like, way. <laughs> yes. And yeah, I like found out all these things obviously after we had been dating a little bit, but just the craziest thing. But we, um, after the hike, so his friend Ryan was with us and my mom and I had left and Ryan was like tearing up in his house and Jason's like, Ryan, are you okay? Like what's, what's happening? And he was like, I just feel like you and Lo would be so great together. And Jason was like, yeah, you might be right. And he just started really pursuing me after that, um, wow. long distance. And yeah. Like okay, so really being fast. a true Southern girl, my parents, yes. <laughs> I ended up marrying a guy from Indiana, but I mean, that okay. was that was like might as well have been from some other foreign culture. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what, were, what was your family thinking? You were like, we're going to lose her to California. Oh my gosh, I know. So, oh man, this is such an interesting like trait about me, but I've realized it over the last probably like 10 years, but... I am the type that does not think about sometimes like the reality of certain things until I'm in it. So even like something that should be a little nerve wracking, like even when I was doing some of those interviews, I was not nervous for any of them. And then I would like think about it afterwards and I'm like, how, oh my gosh, that was so scary. <laughs> Why? Like how is I not <laughs> nervous or whatever? But it's almost like I shut my brain off to, I don't know, like protect myself or something. And uh-huh. I feel like the whole time Jason and I were dating, I was not thinking about the life change it would be to move to LA and leave my family (laughs) and like leave my community and all of that. And then it all hit me when I was in it, which is just a pattern of mine. But I don't feel like I talked to my parents much about it because they weren't like bringing it up to me because they're just kind of like just supporting. They love and always have loved Jason so much. So they're so excited about it. But I know they were thinking about it. We just didn't really talk about it much until it happened. And then I just was like, I feel like I was in shambles for a while and still kind of in just being. You're like, I'm moving to California. (laughs) Yes. And you know, like when something's really exciting, like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to be with Jason in the same city now. And um, it's going to be amazing. And I'm just so excited to be married to him. And that was more in my mind rather than, oh crap, I'm like leaving all my people and how I've grown up and just this culture and all these things. And so I think that's why I wasn't thinking about it, but it's been honestly like one of the biggest struggles um, the last five years. And it's been good just because it's, I feel like that is one aspect that's grown Jason and I so, so close because um, well, part of, I know the term like leave and cleave, but like just literally learning like, okay, Jason's like my person now and I need to trust him with, all these things that I've depended on my family for, because I think it's just been so hard because my family and I got so close after already being close, just through the divorce and through my accident. And it just bonds you like nothing else. And so moving here and coming to a city where no one knew about my accident, which is refreshing and awesome just because, um, I didn't, I didn't have to like talk about it all the time or whatever, but, um, it was nice in a way, but just regarding friends, like I experienced re- really intense fatigue and um, right. even like, I don't know, in Dallas, all my friends went through it with me. So I would just be so confident without my arm on and even my eye, I like take out all the time, but my friends don't even know when it's out because they're just so used to like my eye <laughs> like that. But here right. it's just been a struggle in all those ways because yeah, just, I was like coming into this unknown like universe and 
it just felt really lonely to be honest. Plus your husband works in this industry too. Yes. Yes. And, and LA is notoriously known for loneliness. Like I, any of my oh friends my that have moved to LA are just like, there's like a spirit of loneliness there. Yes. It's so crazy because even like Jason's just put so much effort into creating community here and he has an incredible community. It's like one, like I've never seen before in my life and it's such a gift, but I feel like it's like guys, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, for me, it's been such a struggle, like um, just really developing deep friendships with girls. And a lot of it has to do with honestly, just like my three closest friends live 45 minutes to an hour from me. And so, yeah. and that's just LA. They just live just in a different part of LA, which everyone does. Like no one really lives close by. And so it's just, yeah, it's so true. And I feel like I'm the type two that does really well just with one or two really good friends and just my family and all this stuff. And here, even last night, this sounds like so depressing, but I had an event. Jason was gone for like two nights, um, just randomly for this work thing. And um, I had this event. I was like, he goes, you need to invite someone. Like, don't go by yourself. And I was like, I know. But I was like, I don't know who to invite because this friend's gone because her husband's an actor. So they leave for like months at a time. And then my friend, other friend had this like procedure on her eye. So she couldn't leave the house. And then like I asked three other girls and they just were not available or they live farther away. And I'm like, this is just the story of the city. Like that, mm. you know, it was kind of a picture of like, it's going to be like kind of lonely, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been a learning experience, but. Which, and well, especially growing up with a twin, where does your sister live? Mm -hmm. She lives in Dallas. Okay. So everyone's in Dallas or my family's there. Yeah. Dang, Jason. Uh, I don't know. I know. I don't know. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's like the biggest probably like topic of conversation we have, but it's so, this is just getting really real, but like, or be, being really, really like you, it's like he knows the situation so well and he's such an amazing supporter and makes such an effort just creating a lot of times with my family just to help um, with the situation. But you know, when there's just a situation and there's not a solution. So like yeah. his job, he is so called to this industry. It's amazing. Like the, I don't even, like just the ministry he has just by living his life, like not even, mm -hmm you know, just, it's really, really yeah, incredible. Just his, and, job, just his job as vocation. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And just the community here. And they start like, he's, he started this Bible study in his house that's turned into a church plant here and just so many amazing things. And he's so called. And I see that so strongly on his life, but I don't feel very called here and it's been a struggle. So it's a weird thing to deal with. And, um, my, my friend and I last night actually were texting and she was like, <laughs> she was like, can we create a support group for like struggling with LA, but our husband's loving it. Like just to s literally yeah. support each other and encourage each other. And I was like cracking up. We were laughing so hard, but we were like, actually, can we <laughs> just to like help each other? That's like, actually feel a great idea. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's so totally. silly, but like, so Yeah. It like came out of well, a joke and then we were both like, oh, wow, that's actually a great This idea. is a thing. This is a thing. Well, yeah. some of it too is just finding your thing, you know? Mm -hmm. So tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about dry shampoo. Like, is that? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So is that one of the so, things that you're really pursuing now? Yes. So um, to put a long story short, so I, after my accident started really researching, I had like a lot of bloating issues for years and years. And so I really started like digging into health and my parents are super healthy and um, active and nutritious and stuff. So I feel like I learned a lot growing up, but I really started digging into like, how can I just feel good and not be bloated all the time and all these things. So one of those aspects was clean beauty and just the products we use and all this stuff. So when I was living with Anna um, after my accident, she had this idea to create a dry shampoo for brunettes because she and I are blondes and we used baby powder and we're like oh my gosh brunettes can't really use this because it'll turn their hair gray um and so we started doing a lot of research and came up with this formula for just a really healthy dry shampoo and um it's just become like such a passion of mine just the whole clean beauty space and i i feel like it's just been exploding in the last four or five years just the growth of 
products and this industry is shifting so much. It's so cool. Um, so yeah, we've created a little team. So it's Anna and I, who's my best friend. And then my sister, my twin sister, Brittany, and then her husband, Sean does all the business. And then our friend Lawson in Dallas does all the design and all of that. So, um, it's been so fun. And then this is random, but Jason posted this video of me. I think it was like two years ago, but I was just cleaning an airplane seat and it was just like a funny random Insta story and it like went viral and all these people just started sending us videos of cleaning airplane seats. <laughs> we were like, what is no happening? Like, this is, yeah, it was just like the funniest thing. We were like, oh my gosh, I guess this really connects with people. And um, so we got to the point where like, we should create some wipes, like some really good non-toxic but powerful surface wipes that are really good for your hands that aren't heavy in alcohol and <laughs> things like that. So we're, we've been in that process and we're launching in the third quarter of this year, um, actually a new version of our dry shampoo and then also the wipes. <laughs> so we're really That's excited awesome about it. Because it's true. The beauty yeah. industry has exploded. So you're, it's, yes. the, it's the right time for it. And you already have you know, an audience that would want to buy your products. So I love it. I mean, I love your dry shampoo. It's a great alternative to taking some of my like sprays through the airport. So I'm in. I'm so happy you love it. Yay. Let me know if you ever need a refill. (laughs) Okay. I will. I will. So can we buy it online? Is that where we can buy it? Yes. So it's all being sold on the stranded shop. And then after we launch in the fall or late summer. We're gonna um, we're pursuing some retail things, but we had to basically figure out we the way we were manufacturing it wasn't like retailable. That's not a word, okay. but okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, it was almost too. We were paying too much for the bottle to like put it into retail because it would be like a crazy expensive bottle. If that makes sense, right, right. So yeah, so we've learned so much. <laughs> That's been like part of the journey, but yeah, it's been fun. So is that what's next for you is kind of developing a product line to go along with your focus on wellness on your blog? Yes. And then a big project that I launched in January was the Clean Sweep. So it's like a 90-day subscription program, but it's an instant download thing. So you can kind of take it at your own pace. But I just was getting so many questions about how to clean up your life and how to just what products to use, makeup, beauty, cleaning products, all those things. And I was like, I feel like I just need to create a resource because it'll just answer all these questions and you can get it in one swoop. And I talk about just how to um, fill up your pantry with things that are really healthy for you. Um, Fill up your fridge, clean all those out as well, what to replace them with, and then just how to slowly kind of, I don't know, switch things out that you're using that are toxic to your health and your body and your kids and all these things. So it's been so fun. And it's been a fun journey to be on with people because I feel like more than ever, people are just really getting a hold of their health and they want resources. And I feel like there's so many bad diets that come out so often. And I think those can kind of um, like keep you from fully understanding what's right for your body. Cause I feel like everyone I, that's really general, but a lot of people want like a quick fix and I want to lose weight and I want to feel better and I want to look good. And so they just try everything, but just making it a process and learning what's best for your body. And um, yeah, that's kind of the goal of the clean sweep. So it's been super fun and it's fun to kind of line it up with the products and we're trying to just kind of create missing gaps in the industry with our products. So um yeah, it's been a fun journey and like random, but I feel like that's how God does it. Just he'll put something in your path and just to see how it comes about is pretty cool. I was hanging out with one of my friends who is a psychologist this summer, and he's doing a deep study on body image right now. And he said this one little sentence that has remained with me all summer long, what you focus on becomes important. It made me think about what I focus on. What are the things that I think are important that really aren't important, but it's just because I have focused on them. And what are the things that could become more important if I did focus on them? Lauren focused on health, 
on community and on faith during a traumatic time in her life. And now she's leading others to do the same. So to keep up with Lauren, head on over to laurenscruggskennedy.com. Before we go to launch our new season, I would love it if you would head on over to iTunes and review the podcast. So many of you left such insightful comments on the survey. So just go say those things on iTunes so more people can discover this conversation. Our wonderful music for today's show is by my friend, Ellie Holcomb. Going Scared is produced by Eddie Kolkholtz. And I'm Jessica Honiger. Until next time, let's take each other by the hand and keep going scared.